strategy specialist who designs and develops WordPress websites for people who love their online business but hate their websites. <laughs> She's here for those who are tired of fitting into everyone else's mold, those who are rebelling against sleazy online marketing, those who want a website that takes your customer on a journey and allows you to solve the problems that brought them to Google search. Her straightforward advice has been featured at WordCamps, Soar to Success Magazine, and Pittsburgh Biz TV shows. She's presented to organizations, large and small, to share her love for website creation and passion for making the process simple. When she's not teaching small business owners how to create effective and client attractive websites, you can find her exploring the outdoors, listening to the horse and buggies in her Amish town or enjoying a glass of wine. <laughs> to learn more about Lee Josette and discover how a solid WordPress process can help you rein in your clients, rein in your client projects, visit leejozette.com. Okay, we ready to start. So um, I'm not sure, sure what the official title of this because it was supposed to be Clients from Hell and they've changed it. So, <laughs> so we'll just go with not so ideal clients at WordCamp Pittsburgh. Um, so today we're going to be talking about who it is that you want to work with. So when I was a teenager, 13, 14, uh, my gram pulled me aside, little Polish woman who uh, would not say too much but just enough and she said you know Lee there's two types of people in your life they're those who will support you and lift you up and there's those who will bring you down and it is up to you to decide who you're gonna keep and let go and being a teenager I don't think I listened to a word but for some reason I knew it was important enough to put back in that brain bank and eventually I would need it so many years later I started my business and I started working with five clients and then ten clients a hundred clients and more and that last line it's up to you who you will keep and let go kept resonating with me because I had some pretty great clients but I had a lot of not so ideal clients and what I did was restructured my business based on who I wanted to keep and who I decided needed to be let go and so today we're going to talk about your ideal clients your not so ideal clients and what happens to those who are maybe okay but slowly start to turn into the clients from hell so I'm Lee Drozak. I'm a digital strategist. I've been in business over 10 years. I'm a digital geek who also is a part-time part RVer, and I live in a small Amish town. So let's talk about the ideal clients and the not-so-ideal clients. A lot of times we think that the process starts when you sign on the dotted line and hopefully get that deposit ahead of time and they become your clients, but really it begins with the very first touch. You need to set the expectations. You need to tell that client what is important to you just as much as what is important to them. You need to have a deep understanding of who your perfect client is. You know, the who, the what, and the why. Why are they seeking you out? What can you provide them? But more importantly, you need to define the values of your business. What is that boundary line that you will not let anyone cross? What is it that will keep you or keep the joy in your business of a joyful business? You need to understand the mind of the client so that you can give them what they need but on the same token you need to make sure that you set it so that they don't get on your very last nerve. And how do you do that? By designing a vetting process. So the client relationship actually starts with the very first touch. And you have to determine how are you going to structure that first touch and then go from there. So I created a vetting process that uses a couple tools that I have found have been really helpful in setting the bar with how the rest of the client relationship goes. 
So first of all, I don't take any phone calls because being a strategist, designer, and developer, when I'm in the middle of my zone, I don't want to be interrupted by a phone call because it takes too much time to regroup from that. So I have an appointment system. And if you can't set an appointment with me, then um, I probably won't work with you because that's the first way that they're crossing my boundaries. What I did was I created an intro packet. And so my intro packet is not a welcome packet. My intro packet is what are my office hours? What is my communication style? What is my work style? How is it that I define what's important to me? And what I did was I gathered this up and I put it in a PDF. And anybody who sets an appointment with me, when the appointment is confirmed, and I use Acuity, and I use Acuity because I can set a multiple of different appointments, plus I can send tailored responses to whatever that appointment type is. So when they book an appointment and when they get a reminder, they have this thing in there that says, hey, by the way, here's my intro packet that explains my work style and my business values. Please take a moment to download it and review it. And when we have our appointment, clarify anything that isn't important. I found that by calling attention to this, they already know these are things that are important to me and they need to be important to you to work with me. And this has kind of weeded out a lot of the needy clients versus the not so needy clients. And I know it's really hard when you're kind of starting a business because sometimes you need to work with everybody, but at least this allows you to set the bar to begin with. For basically, you have to determine what's important to you and you have to hold your ground on it. So the next thing that I do is I have a face-to-face -face or a virtual face-to-face -face conversation that I basically call my jive time. It need, I need to know if we're going to jive, if we can communicate, if we can talk, if you're, if you're on the same understanding level as me. Well, the reason that I do a face-to-face -face or a virtual is because I want to see expressions because a lot of times people will talk the talk, but they tell you what they think you want to hear or they tell you, tell you what they think that you think they want to hear. So I need to see, do they look confused? Um, do they kind of look a little disturbed by some of the questions that we're having? Because in my face-to-face, -face, I not only ask them questions about their projects, I ask them the red flag questions. Have you ever worked with a designer before? If they say yes, I'll be like, you know, how many? Or how did that relationship go? And I actually had someone one time say, I've worked with six designers and I have yet to find anybody who can work up to my standards. And I was like, okay, this isn't gonna go well, but let me ask a couple more questions. Um, so I know going in what the parameters are, what the red flags are, and sometimes it's as simple as it's a project that I, I don't think that I can take on or maybe that I can find someone better to do or maybe it's just not in, in my realm of what I want to do. And sometimes it's just that I don't want to work with a micromanager who I know is going to just be too demanding and take up way too much of my time and not respect the things that I've set for my business. It's a gut check. It really is a gut check conversation. So when you have that conversation, then you have to make the decision yes or no. Well, the yeses are really easy. You get along with the client, you want to work with them, you get the contract signed, you move them to the next phase. But what happens to the no's? Because some people, when you tell them no, um, they can get a little mean-spirited or they can bad talk you. So I have what I call an exit plan. And an exit plan isn't just for firing a client or firing a team member. An exit plan also is how do you say no in a respectful manner? How do you say no so that you turn them away, but it's more of they have to make the decision of not working with you rather than you saying, I don't want to work with you because I know this is going to be really difficult for me. So it happens to be in my business, I have three different scenarios. And one is 
Um, maybe they thought they were ready to switch from Wix to WordPress, but then they kind of are hesitant and they don't want to. And I'll be like, look, I really appreciate, I'm all for doing what works for you, but here's the thing, I design in WordPress. Let me give you a couple people who I know work with that platform. Would you like me to make the introduction or give you the information? So I am saying no, but by saying, look, I respect your decision to stick with that. It's just not me. It's not not what I work with. The second scenario is they might not be ready to start that project. A lot of website design is planning and making sure all the ducks are in a row. So I might have someone who comes to me who doesn't have the copy that they need. And I would say to them, look, I really would love to work on your project with you, but here's the thing. I think you really need to hone your messaging and your content. I have a couple people that I partner with. I can bring them in to kick this project off. Is this an avenue you want to explore or would you like me to give them your, your name and number and you reach out to them. So I'm still saying I'm interested in the project but you're not quite there yet. And then there's the people who they have hit every red flag and I am like there is no way on God's green earth I am working with them. But I don't want to tell them that. So usually what I do is say you know your project sounds pretty interesting but I'm nine months booked out and it sounds like you need a website yesterday. So let me give you a couple resources to help you pick maybe the perfect person that would work with you. I don't usually refer anyone because if I don't want to work with them, I know my friends don't want to work with them either. So I'm still sending them away, but I'm letting them think I'm too booked out and you need this yesterday. So if it's that important, you need to find somebody else. So the whole idea is to say no without really saying no, so that you send them on their way um, feeling like they were empowered to make the decision not to work with you, because you never know who is going to be a referral source for you. You never know who is going to send you that next paying client that is ideal. So we've said no and then we've said yes. So what happens to the ones that we think are ideal? We need to keep them that way. And what we need to do is we need to get our clients to feel like partners. We need to make them think that we are invested in their business as they are in ours and vice versa. So what I usually do is when I do my kickoff call, I get to know their backstory. Why are you in business? How did you get started? How did you get to the point where you are? These are all things that are going to help me to design the project to begin with, but they're also little tidbits of information that I can use if I ever have to diffuse a bad situation down the road. I also ask them, like, what do you do in your spare time? Or I do some, usually do a lot of recon on them. Oh, you have kids that play baseball. My daughter played basketball. I totally get what it's like to have a crazy schedule. Just something that, uh, that allows us to connect because when you're connected with that client they get more involved and it's easier for them to not be so difficult when they think that there's a personal relationship at stake as well. The second thing you have to do is not hide from them. You need to be visible and present um, silence is not golden, especially in a client-vendor relationship. You need to be able to communicate. Um, you need to make sure that you're available to them. So while I don't take phone calls, I have special appointment slots set up for my clients so that they know if it's something that is better than an email conversation that maybe entails like 15 back and forth, they can just say, hey, I need 10 minutes to talk to you. I set up the appointment. Let's talk about this then. Or if they send me an email that says, I don't really think we're on the same page I'll say you know what like I've got 15 minutes at this point of time let's jump on the phone and clear it up so that they know they have access to me and that I can be communicative the second thing is stop speaking jargon and technical you don't need to be a smarty pants they've already hired you talk in plain English a lot of times what happens especially in WordPress design and development is we're on a different plane as far as technology and terminology. So I have one client and I was talking design. Well, when I think of design, I think of functionality, I think of usability, I think of accessibility. 
My client, on the other hand, thinks of design as, well, this is my logos and these are the colors I wanted. Oh, I use this font too. So you can see, like, we weren't even in the same ballpark at that point. So what I did was I put together a list of terminology that I use and the way that I use it, and I send that to the client just so that they have an idea. When I talk design, this is what I'm talking about. When I talk development, this is what I'm talking about. And, you know, even the stages, this is what I entail launch to be, pre-launch to be, post-launch to be, maintenance, so that they have an understanding of where I'm coming from. And then you need to be proactive and organized. I'm like the queen of systems. So not only do I have a client portal, I have Asana for my project management system. And some people are like, well, that's way too much. But each place has a different function. And I found that by having different places with different functions, the technology and organization is a little easier for my clients to use. They know that they can go to my client portal to get all the resources they need, the templates to submit content, or maybe a PDF on how to reuse and repurpose content. Or they have a checklist of what all the post-launch features are. There's a lot of resources that I've developed for them to keep them informed, where the project management system is the task list. This is what I'm doing. This is when I'm doing it. This is where you come in. These are the dates on it. All the specifics of the project. And I found that by being proactive and organized, a lot of my, a lo it's, alleviated a lot of the stress of a lot of my clients because they feel empowered to make the decision to download that resource or to follow along with the project. So you want to make sure that you make it easy for them to get all the information that they need and to also not go into that one more thing phase because the one more thing phase is the never-ending project. It's human nature to, um, to avoid things that make us uncomfortable and unrealistic. So when a problem arises, we need to um, be realistic instead of overly optimistic. So when they say, okay, I just have to edit that content one more time, and you're like, this is like the 10th time that they've done this, what the heck? You already should have something in place that says, you know what, here's the thing. Um, I appreciate that you need to make this change, but you'll notice in the contract the revisions say that you get two revisions. And you'll notice on the revision doc, it, that entails what it is. I'm not saying that you can't change the content, but we need to get launched and then change the content after that because we don't want this project to never launch. Because when your projects don't launch, you don't get paid. And one more thing will turn into one more thing and one more thing and one more thing so you need to hit that head on because those one more things that accumulate they make a client frustrated they make a client difficult and they make them the client from hell so the other thing that you can do is give them directions and tools. So like I said, I have my client portal. I have a ton of resources to combat how to alleviate the blocks, um, frequently asked questions, checklists, PDFs, things that explain all the different stumbling blocks that I have found that clients run into. And it's easy to do this because you're going to have clients that are going to run into these stumbling blocks too. So if you create a resource for them, it might take a little time right now, but in the long run, it will, it will save you tons of time and heartache and headache. And it will also allow that client who is starting to become a little difficult or a little stressed or a little confused to say I'm not the only one who've had this because she like has all this information on it so it must not just be me and it kind of helps to give them some structure to the project and it also allows you to set the stage for what is going to happen when it's going to happen and it gives you a point to stick to it it you know I have that document because in the contract it says this or I would gladly do that for you, but this is you know, another part of the project or this might be phase two. So by you allowing the project to happen and the client to not take control, you are essentially keeping the bar high and keeping them um, from becoming you know, not so great clients. 
A project usually goes south because the client takes control of the project. When you allow the client to take control, you've lost <coughs> the ability to negotiate and have that advantage. So don't let it happen. Offer solutions, but don't cave. Um, but there's always that project that will totally go south. So what happens when things go south? Nobody wants to fire a client because clients are money, projects are money, they pay us, we're in business to make money. So you have to determine, is this a challenging project or is this a challenging client? A challenging project with a good client can have a really good outcome if you start to think outside the box and think differently. Where a challenging client with even the simplest project will be like nails on a chalkboard. It's no matter what you do, it's not going to happen. They're not going to be happy. So you have to determine, is it time to fire this client? You know, there's a phrase, um, hire slow and fire fast. So I always remember that, fire fast. And the first thing I ask myself is, is the client actually the problem? Have I exhausted all of the solutions to make them happy and to keep this on task? Then I have to look at the big picture is, am I losing money? Is this client costing me money to keep this project going? Is this something that I want to continue to do? Am I paying people and I'm not getting paid myself? Or um, like, am I in the red, am I in the black? What is going on? Bad clients are always unhappy customers. So you have to figure out, is this time to cut the cord and fire fast? And a lot of times it is yes, because it doesn't matter what you do, it doesn't matter how you alleviate it, they're not gonna be happy, and happy people, or unhappy people are bad clients. So don't just rip the Band-Aid off. Like the exit strategy that we started with, we need to have an exit strategy at this point and we want to part ways respectfully because chances are that there's already a ton of tension right now and it's not going to get any better. And the first thing that you want to do is you want to address the issues but restate them and reframe them because you don't want them bad mouthing you to other potential clients. Don't insult them. Um, make them part of the decision. Again, make them part of the decision to say, I can't work with you, I'm done working with you, you're on my last nerve, and nothing I say or do is gonna be good enough. So what I do is I created a script, and I follow that script to a T. Because I'm good off the cuff until it comes to that difficult decision of firing a client. Because it doesn't matter whether you do it once, five times or 20 times, it is not an easy thing to do. Um, because we're not cold hearted and we know that there's usually underlying issues to that. So what I do is I say, look, we need to have t a 10 minute conversation about your project. Can we talk at, you know, and I, I make sure that I schedule the time within the like day or two. Like I don't put it off. I don't want to put it off. I need to get this behind me. And I say, you know, um, it seems like we haven't been able to do our job to keep you as a happy customer and then I go into my script. So I say, like, look, I'd love to say that while I followed our process, it is generally a good fit that most of our clients um, happen to like, but clearly we can't live up to that and I'm really sorry about that. So I already set the tone by saying, look, what I've had worked for other people, obviously it's not working for you, I really apologize for that. But what I've learned over the years is that when clients feel like they're not being well served, it's best for them to begin working with someone else. So I'm setting the stage to say, I know we're not, and they already know this too, we're not working well together. Maybe it's time you move on. And then I flesh out the details of kind of what I feel went wrong. You know, maybe your vi we can't get the vision that you're trying to convey, or maybe, you know, you need something different, whatever it is, and then say, you know, we've made all the changes that you've requested, but we still feel at this point like there's something off here. Um, 
And so in light of that, we think you would best be served if you found another designer, developer, strategist, whatever the role is that you're providing with them. And then I always finish it with, you know what, I'm going to personally oversee the gathering of your files and assets because I want them to know I've already worked for you. You are not getting your deposit back. I will give you the assets that you paid for but that's going to be where it ends there so um, and so you can give it to the next person maybe they can use it to start off your project so you're not starting from square one and then I say you know what like if if you have any questions we'll answer them for you so it's not like I'm just shutting them out I'm giving them some options once I send them on their way and then I say best of luck to you on your journey again if there's anything we can do we will certainly help you any way that we can so it kind of leaves the firing like, um, okay, we can't work with you, and so you need to make the decision to leave this, and we're going to give you everything, and we're going to help you as much as you can, but that's it. We're done. Nine times out of ten, the client who feels probably the same way we do is a little relieved. Like we, and they didn't have to make that difficult decision. We made it, we put the ball back in their court and they're like, okay, you know, how do we move forward with getting the files, blah, 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 blah. And the conversation goes that way. And then we end on not, so, not such a bad note. Because we need to remember that bad customers or bad clients aren't necessarily bad people. I mean, there might be a couple that are bad people, but for the most part. Um, it's just that their behavior usually has nothing to do with you. It could be that they weren't as ready as they thought they would be. Or maybe they thought they were going to go one direction and they're changing to another. Um, and it doesn't affect the job that you did for them. It usually is they're not ready for what you have and the value that you can bring. So you really, you know, you kind of try to need to remember walk in their shoes with every decision that you made. Um, you're never not going to have a bad client. You're never not going to have another bad client, but it's what you do to address it so that you know instead of having five bad clients, the next time you're only going to have four or the next time you're only going to have two um, or every occasionally you're going to get one and you know how to combat them. So I hope that the information has been helpful to you um, and I have a lot of resources available uh, that I use that ne might not necessarily um, work for you but for the vetting I use Acuity, um, I use Dropbox for my PDFs because as they're living breathing documents as I work with people so it's easy to update them and not have to update another link I just upload the, the updated version to Dropbox. Um, I use Asana for my project management system. I found that for my people, that's the easiest for them to use. I do use the paid version, um, but the free version worked for me for a long, long time. Um, I have a client portal, which I use, clientportal.io. Um, I scored that deal on AppSumo. That's why I use that. It seems to be the best for me. And then um, for my face-to-faces I either use Skype or Zoom um, because I found that those are the most versatile for most people usually one person has used either one or the other so if you have any questions for me or you need any clarification um, I'm here to answer them and if not I will be at lunch if you have something maybe private that you don't want to discuss in an open forum um, I will take that question too I have question. so you mentioned earlier that um, clients who won't provide you content for their proposed site and how your strategy for dealing with that would be, oh, I have people I could put you in touch with to help you with this. What if you don't have that resource? Do you have any advice on how you could get people to give you content? So the question is if you have, if someone needs content or even another type of vendor, whether it be graphic artist or not, and you don't have those resources, uh, what do you do? How do you find them? So you find a community, whatever communities you're in, and you start forming partnerships. So what I do is every once in a while in the groups that I'm active in, in my masterminds, I reach out and say, hey, do you know any good copywriters? Do you know any graphic artists? Do you know any designers? I want to schedule a coffee date with them. Um, so that we can have a conversation and then I meet with those people and we work out a deal so 
if I were to hire you, what would the what would the subcontract rate be? Or if I send someone to you, what's your referral rate? I will tell you this now. If somebody says I don't give referral rates, unless they are so kick ass it's not even funny. I don't even they're like they're they're the last on the list. So you want to find a way to get partnerships that will help your business and make you money. Um, and you just have to find them. It, it takes a lot of work. That's probably um, one of the hardest things is to find people and keep good people. Um, but once you start to have that referral network, it seems to build on itself. But I always start with my internal networks. Who's in my mastermind group? Um, I go to my coach. Hey, do you know anybody for this? I go to the Facebook groups that I'm most active in. Who do you know for this? So go to the groups that you're already part of. And then if you can't find anybody there, then kind of go outside of that. Anyone else? Do you, when you're trying to vet somebody like that, do you just send them just like a pro project to do that's maybe for a personal site or something before you put your client reputation on the line with somebody you haven't used before? Yes, yeah, so the question is, what do I do for vetting them? So what I usually do is I send them one of my projects. If it's a graphic artist, hey, I need this graphic for a blog post. If it's an article, you know. A lot of times copywriters will have a portfolio of writing that they've done. I also will go and read their blog. If they don't have a blog, I'm kind of like, you're a writer. Or, if they, or I'll look at the writing on their website. And if I don't think that it fits with me, I kind of, I still might have a conversation with them because sometimes we get busy and we're like the cobbler's children where shoes are always the last. So I make sure that I do as much vetting, but I usually send them a, a, my own project first so that I can see because what some people's standards are aren't necessarily mine. And also, you don't need to do individual people. There are different, like, so if I have a smaller project and I need a logo for, um, there's a site called Logo in 30 Minutes, logoin30minutes.com, and it's like $39 for a logo. And if you just need a basic logo for someone who's starting out, like they turn it around like that, they are really, really good. So no, it doesn't necessarily need to be one person, it can be a company like that. But I, that's what I do, is I kind of just feel them out and vet them on my own before I send them. And Or if I have somebody who's new, I will get one of my long-term clients and say, hey, I'm testing out this person. Can I send that project? Can I send that page copy to them? You know, and give me your honest feedback. So fine too, if you have some like good clients that really that you can have open dialogue with, let test them on those people too. Thank you. So in an environment where you might get a lot of referrals uh, from people who preface it with, this is a really tough one. Can you take that on? And this person refers you a lot of good business, but then you, you know, this uh, occasional bad one comes along. Uh, what's your general thought in terms of saying yes or no to that because of the referral relationship? Okay, so the question is, if you have a referral and it maybe isn't bad, how do you deal with it? So I did have this problem come up. Um, I had a client and she sends me a ton of referrals and she sent me one and this woman was difficult. And against better judgment, I said, I'm gonna go ahead and take it. But I had a conversation with her first. I was like, look, I don't know if I can work with her. Like, you might need to run on interference. I know this client is important to you. And it got really bad. And so I, I was like, look, I gotta fire her. And she said, let me have a conversation with her first. So I make sure that I keep the ref whoever has referred to me in the loop, because that person knows um, that you're gonna occasionally come across somebody who's difficult. I, I had a referral even called, he's like, look, I know this person's gonna be tough, but I'm doing all the copy. All I need you to do is the design. Can you give me a couple mock-ups? We'll pick it, I'll rein them in. Um, so, I, so we knew ahead of time he was gonna be difficult. I knew that I wouldn't have to deal with the crap that came along with it. He was gonna deal with it. So I think you have to do every scenario on its own, but always if you have a problem with someone who's referred to you, 
Um, let that person know. Don't just let the relationship get bad and try because this is a good referral source. And don't be afraid to call them and say, hey, look, I talked to your person. Uh, like, I don't think this is going to work. I can't deal with them. Because either they're going to say, cool, no problem. I totally get it. I respect your, you as a business owner and a business. Or, you know what, let's try and figure out a way. This person's a really good client of mine, and I want, they want you to work on their project. So I like put the ball back in their court almost. You mentioned some red flags earlier in the presentation. Can you add on to that? What are some other red flags that make you go, oh, I don't know about that? So a couple. The question is, what are some of the other red flags? Um, so some, if if we are having a conversation, and it's hard to even communicate, I know that that's going to be a problem because if I can't communicate you at the very beginning of the project, I don't think I'm going to be able to communicate with you down the road. Um, some of them might be too that I look at their aesthetic and I'll say, you know what? Like I see what you have. Are you open to updating your logo? And if they're like, oh no, I've had my logo for 10 years and I am not changing it I'm like look they're not going to be flexible um, I just worked on a project from a guy he came from corporate he is now retiring going on his own and I was like look um, we need to talk about your logo he's like I'm gonna tell you right now I know my branding sucks I did it myself I was like just trying to get this thing off the ground whatever you can do I would really appreciate it so just kind of listen to things that you think are going to be potential problems and either ask follow-up questions. Usually mine are if we have trouble communicating, um, if I ask them a question and there's no flexibility, or if they've worked with ton, uh, tons of other people, what, not even designers, like I've worked with 10 copywriters and they just don't get my vision. Or I've worked with four graphic artists and I have yet to find one. So then I dig a little deeper, like is it that they're really four crappy? Are you trying to hire them all from Fiverr and getting quality graphics for Fiverr? dollars like what is the problem and how can we figure out if it's you or if it's you know some other situation or scenario so that was a, a perfect one you just mentioned how do you give the clients that you know, clients that, that understand they have to pay for for content development but they don't have it Is that my first client way back in the day I met him at a workshop he was just starting out with some construction. He gave him one business card and said, I do this. And that's it. So I created all this content. I mean, that logo, that was it. So no, no domain name, no email, no anything. And I've been working with them for over 10 years. And, and they decided to have new people come in and, and they wanted to go a different way. I thought, develop all this stuff. So the question is, um, how do you get them to invest? So first of all, here's what I say to people. Would you expect one of your customers or clients to hire you and not pay you anything? And they're like, um, no. And then I say, okay, so if you're not willing to invest in your business, why should any of your clients invest in your business? And then I think just by those statements, the light bulbs go off. And, and so usually what I do is if someone needs everything, a logo, content, I price everything out individual so that they can see this is what it's going to cost. And if you have to cut corners somewhere, you have to figure out where to cut the corners. And if you're not willing, like a logo, if they have terrible branding and they're not willing to invest in it, I have the difficult conversation like, look, I thought I could work with you, but if you're not going to make the investment in your branding, I'm not doing your website because you're website is a reflection of me and even though it's aesthetic it's still a reflection of me because I can make this thing so user-friendly and functional but if it doesn't look appealing it doesn't matter you know same with work if somebody doesn't want to invest in copywriting I'll say you know what here's what I'm gonna put the copy on there that you have or I'll put dummy content in there but know this you're not gonna get SEO ranking juice from this you're not gonna reach your client because they're not gonna be understanding what you're trying to say so I give them if you don't invest in this this is gonna be the outcome if you want to spend some money now and invest in your business then this will be the outcome but I think the thing that has always worked for me is if you're not willing to invest in yourself why would anybody else invest in you this is the value that I bring if you don't appreciate it then we have a problem we need to talk about it and figure out whether to part ways or not 
So I, so educating depends on the size of the site. So if it's a small site, um, I have a lot of resources. I've amassed a lot of resources. And at first, people thought I was crazy for like creating all that. They're like, why are you giving all that free stuff? Now I'm like, you know what? Like here, I have a resource. Go ahead and check that out. And if you have questions, ask me. So my uh, time educating has really been cut down by having the resources available. Sometimes it's sending them to a blog post. Sometimes I'll create a video for them because I think if I create a video for them and they have this question, nine times out of ten, somebody else is going to have that same question. So I always create content with it in mind that this is going to be usable somewhere down the road. And then by making it available to my people um, as just an added bonus, to them it's value and it, it kind of appeases them and I don't have to spend as much time with them. So even for the training, I have um, the plugin video user manual and I think there's WP 101 that is basically how to use your WordPress website. They keep it all up to date. I'm like, hey look, you have a video tutorial bank in your dashboard. Here's where you find it. Go ahead and watch that and if you have any questions then please come ask me. Even something as small as that will cut your individual training time down. So just look at places that are taking you a lot of time and say, how can I redo this so that I don't have to spend the individual time, I can put something together to give to my clients as a resource bank. Anyone else? Do you, what do you do to kind of control the work you've already done? so that you don't get the call that, hey, great news, uh, my nephew's into the internet, and he's gonna do our website now, and get booted. Do you do anything? In yes, the I do. So the question is, how do you combat the my nephew is a website designer and I'm going to let him maintain the site? So I have two things in my contract. I have a maintenance clause that says, if you use us for maintenance, here's what you'll get. If you don't use us for maintenance and you use somebody else, the onus is on them. And then I have a third party vendor clause. And the third party vendor says, if you have a third party, come in and do anything to the site. I am not responsible when they break it. I will gladly fix it for you. It is going to cost you. And I, uh, if it's unusable, that's on you. Um, and I did this because I actually had a client who had their VA come in and do something. And she's like, I think she broke my site. Well, thank God I had a backup. I had a backup, so that was a good thing, but I was like, look, you're gonna have to pay me. And she's like, well, you created the site, and I was like, y yeah. And it, I kinda had to negotiate that, and immediately after that, I was like, oop, I'm putting a third party clause in my, because now when it happens, I'm like, if you look at your contract, it states that this is a service I do provide, but it's like you being a new client, I have to start from square one to determine what happened and why it happened. Yeah, even better than that one is when you, when you fire a client or whatever it works, they go to a new vendor and they want you to move everything up and move where you go. That's, I, how do you handle that? So I have, at the end of a project, I do what I call a closeout. And the closeout is I give them a document with all of their passwords, all of their logins, how to access their site, um, FTP, cPanel, everything. And so I say, you can either use that, like I use that because I have someone do maintenance for me. So I use that document if they're going to stick with me for maintenance or they can send it to somebody else. And then in Dropbox, I put all of their assets, any images that we created for them if the logo is in there or the branding is in there any content even when they provide us the content we make a copy of it put it in that folder and then I make a complete backup of the file a full site backup and a database backup put it in there and I send it to them and I say please keep this in a safe place make sure you download it I because we only maintain the folder for 30 days if you don't continue with us here's everything you need for your site and oh if something happens in the meantime 
time, usually the server or the host has a backup, but I wouldn't rely on it. Here's the safest bet for you. And then they can either take it and have somebody else move it or they can do what, whatever. But if we are ending the relationship and they are moving on to somebody else, we give them the tools at that point that we sever or close out. And then we kind of have it in case something happens, but we're like, we're not responsible. Um, if you want to have, you know, a lot of people have employees or teams. If you want to do that, that's fine. Um, but here's the parameters of that. So you kind of set yourself up to say, we would love to do maintenance for you, but we understand if you have a team member, here's everything you're going to need. Um, and then we kind of say, put it in a safe place because after so many days, it's not accessible. And then if they come back to us, we were like, do you have the information that we gave you? And nine times out of 10, they're like, no, I forgot to download it. Um, I, don't ca I usually keep my stuff for like six months um, because it's, if something's going to happen, it's going to happen in that six month period. And and then I get rid of it. It's not like 30 days and it's gone. So at least I have a starting point. Anyone else? Uh, there's no other questions. It's lunchtime. <laughs> Thanks, everyone. Have a good rest of the afternoon.